Hi, and welcome to Senior Issues Etc. My name is Jamie Portnoy, and I am the host for Senior, Senior Issues Etc. filling in for Vita Verdon. Um, just a little background about me. Um, I am filling in again, as I said, for Vita. Um, and Vita and Gloria have taken me under their wing. Uh, and helped me to mentor me as uh, helped me uh, for my show, Dietitian's Dialogue. Um, I cannot thank them so much for all of their wonderful help and support as much as they have helped me um, to help me develop my wonderful show. Um, but I, like I've said, I cannot help thank them enough, uh, but they've done so much for me. So just a little bit uh, update with Vita. Vita is doing wonderful in the nursing home. She is um, uh, about walking on a cane, um, up to walking on a cane, I should say. So she should be back with her shows in hopefully December. Uh, so she's doing great. Uh, so back with our show today, we have a wonderful guest, um, Dr. Kenneth Portnoy, who is an optometrist who I know very well. Um, he is my dad, and he's here today to um, tell us all about uh, the eye, what it entails, and even much more about that. So, um, hi, Dr. Kenneth Portnoy. Hi, Jamie. First of all, thank you so much for having me here today. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Before we get to know um, all there is to know about optometry, about the eye, um, let's get to know a little bit about you. So um, tell us a little bit about what your hobbies are and um, just a little bit about you. Sure, Jamie. So uh, my name is Dr. Ken Portnoy. As Jamie said, I'm, a, I'm an optometrist for about the last 37 years. Um, I actually enjoy um, snow skiing, cycling, traveling, and especially spending time with my three wonderful grandchildren, Noah, Peyton, and Cooper. So as this is Vita's show, and um, we have to follow, obviously, Vita's tradition, mm -hmm. so I know Vita loves every one of her guests to blow kisses to, obviously, people that they love. So as you just mentioned, your three beautiful grandchildren, who obviously I know very well, um, let you blow them out three kisses. I would love to. Noah, Peyton, and Cooper. I love you. Great. And that was wonderful. Very well done. So now um, let's talk a little bit. How did you become interested in becoming an optometrist? Sure. Well, I know that I wanted to be in the healthcare profession and I was deciding between optometry, podiatry, dentistry, and medicine. And there became an opportunity for me to get into optometry school after two or even three years of undergraduate school. And I was very fortunate to get accepted to Illinois College of Optometry in 1974 after three years of undergraduate and um, had the opportunity to come out to Chicago and uh, took the opportunity. So you said come out to Chicago. So where were you prior to Chicago? So I was really born and raised and grew up on Long Island in New York, where my three grandchildren reside now. <laughs> yes. And what were you, where did you go to um, undergraduate and college and everything? Tell us a little bit about your background in New York. Sure. So I, I went to a school called East Meadow High School. Mm -hmm. And after graduating from there, I went to uh, Nassau Community College, where I received an AA degree after two years transferred to CW Post College on Long Island, where um, I was then fortunate after that third year of getting accepted to uh, Illinois College of Optometry here in Chicago. So when you came out to Chicago, um, was it ever a thought in your head to kind of go back to New York? So that's an interesting question. It certainly was my thought to go back to New York and practice out there. And while going to optometry school, I uh, met my wife working for a catering company, putting myself through school. and. Um, she is an only child, and as a result of that, uh, pretty much sealed the deal that I was going to stay in Chicago. <laughs> well then. Um, all right, so while you were finishing optometry school, what was your first job uh, out of school? So my very first job was working for an uh, independent private uh, doctor out here, but uh, knew that I really wanted to uh, have my own practice at some point. So after, after um, working for an independent um, practice, what, 
what led you to your full-time position obviously now? Sure, so there uh, was a company that was just starting to franchise uh, their locations in the Chicago area called Pearl Vision, which um, I bet most of your viewers have heard that name before. And uh, there was an opportunity in uh, Wheeling where in uh, September of 1982, we opened up our first uh, Pearl Vision. So uh, obviously, um, I'm sure most of our viewers are very familiar with Pearl Vision. Um, and as you said, you have one in Wheeling, and what is the other one? So uh, 13 years ago, we opened up our second location in Lake Zurich, Illinois. Okay, so you have two? We have two locations, and we have some very fine doctors that also work alongside of me. Oh, very good. So let us know a little bit about what a typical day is like. Sure, so um, our, our day in, in, in our clinic and our office uh, is seeing a wide variety of patients. We can see children, adolescents, adults, and, and, and seniors. And in the course of those examinations, we can do uh, examinations for glasses, for contact lenses, for laser vision consultation, and um, what's becoming very prominent today as diabetes is increasing is uh, full comprehensive diabetic evaluations uh, on the patients that we see. We also see emergencies when patients have red eyes. Uh, they can come in and seek treatment for that as, as well. So you said you see patients of obviously all different ages, yes. um, from pediatrics to geriatrics. Correct. So obviously, you know, we want to touch a little bit more on geriatrics. Yes. So let's break it down a little bit, and um, what are the different disease states that you see more um, predominantly in geriatric patients? Sure, Jamie, so that's a great question. So today, um, probably the three biggest concerns for uh, the aging population would be cataracts, glaucoma, and a condition called age-related macular degeneration. Okay, so those are the three that we generally tend to see. Yes. So obviously, those are the three conditions, and I don't want it to do all three in one because sure. <laughs> um, that tends to be obviously, you know, sure. three big words and three um, very, you know, um, comprehensive disease states. Sure, so let's break it down. Good. And let's take the three separate disease entities individually, Good. and we'll talk about a little bit about the uh, uh, the uh, risk factors, the treatments, the causes, etc. Okay, so let's break down then um, glaucoma. Sure. So glaucoma is a disease characterized generally by high pressure inside the eye, mm -hmm. and we use a very simple instrument to initially measure the pressure in the eye. And if the pressure is elevated for a long period of time, it can cause changes to the optic nerve head, which ultimately can result in visual loss and, if untreated, blindness. So when we get a high pressure reading, there are many other tests that we now have the availability of doing to further make that diagnosis and be able to treat the patients. The incidence of glaucoma in today's population, according to a 2010 National Institute of Health study, is about 1.9, very close to 2% of, of the population. The incidence of glaucoma increases with age and family history. Some of the risk factors, in, uh, additionally, in glaucoma is, um, as I said, uh, um, age and, and family history. The treatment today for glaucoma starts off with a single drop one time a day and can lead up to more drops and then ultimately a surgical intervention if the drops are not controlling the condition. So I, I want to actually touch on this. So if a patient who is obviously um, more of the elderly population, mm -hmm. you said um, they have a, a genetics. Mm -hmm. Now, um, say for example, someone who has obviously a family history of this, should we be screening earlier? So, so Jamie, that also is a great question. And what we need to do to uh, keep an eye on these patients is really check them every year. And if we do a comprehensive full eye examination, checking the pressures at least initially is part of that. And then we have other tests today, such as what we call visual field testing. And we have some new technology today called, or newer technology called an OCT. An OCT stands for optical coherence tomography, which is like an ultrasound, but uses light waves. It lets us take a peek into the layers of the retina, where before this technology, we can really only look at the back of the eye, now we can see structures that we can't see just from looking into the eye. 
And these new or newer uh, technology allows us to make a diagnosis earlier and hopefully prevent vision loss and getting it uh, treated as soon as possible. So when we can do this from pediatrics going forward? This, this, test, uh, this new technology has uh, a lot of uses, and, and yes, it can be used on uh, many different conditions, uh, just about any age group. And then, so this would prevent um, even once we get a little bit older, is that correct? Correct. Very good. Um, and now let's go on to the second disease state. Sure. And that is, um, as we stated, um, cataracts. Cataracts. Sure. So cataracts um, is, is a condition that basically if we all live long enough today, we'll all get it. Probably about 50%, again, according to another National Institute of Health study, of patients over 75 will get cataracts. Um, cataracts is a cloudiness of the lens inside the eye. The lens inside the eye is normally clear like a piece of saran wrap, but as it ages, it becomes more cloudy, more filmy, more milky, more like a piece of wax paper rather than a piece of saran wrap. When the vision is reduced in cataracts, and it's reduced below a level of approximately 20-40, which by the state standards is the minimum to pass the vision part of a driver's test, we would then refer that patient out for an evaluation and treatment that is basically consists of surgery today to remove that cloudy lens and put an IOL or an intraocular lens implant into the eye. So is there anything, obviously, as you said, um, you know, ultimately we'll probably all get cataracts at some mm -hmm. point. Is there anything that we can do to prevent the cataracts? Uh, another great question. Um, you're my daughter, so I know you get great questions. <laughs> uh, but those the risk factors with cataracts include um, smoking, excessive ultraviolet light exposure, diabetes, obesity, prolonged use of corticosteroids, and all these things can contribute to um, the formation of cataracts even possibly at, a, at an earlier age. It doesn't preclude somebody from getting a cataract in their 40s where this whole process of the lens changing actually starts. So basically, again, obviously you said obesity and, and everything, so it's kind of just everything in, in moderation. As a, as a dietitian, we kind of just tell our patients everything in moderation too and, and, and diet exercise. Um, so you just kind of want to um, you want to just keep watching. Is that what you're doing? That, that's a very good. That's very good advice. And because we don't know how fast the cataract is going to progress or mature or ripen, um, we may want to reevaluate that patient in three months, in six months, or a year, because you just don't know when that cataract is going to be is going to be ready. So keeping a close eye on them, seeing how comfortable the patient is with their vision. And when we get to a point where we can't correct it with lenses anymore and it falls below that roughly 2040 threshold, that's the time that we would send them to a surgeon for, for that evaluation. So um, also same thing too with the cataracts um, by just doing yearly checkups and yearly, I shouldn't say checkups, but um, Comprehensive examinations. Comprehen comprehensive examinations. Um, you'll be able to kind of pinpoint when um, or if they need more of a referral for. A absolutely. Okay. Now another one that we kind of mentioned was um, macular degeneration. Sure. And you kind of said something more along the lines of when um, the more of the geriatric population. Um, you had a different name for that. Is that correct? So age-related macular degeneration is uh, definitely contributing towards the uh, uh, biggest vision loss you know, today um, due to the changes in the macula, which is hence its name, age-related macular degeneration. The macula is the very central, crucial, sharp area of your central vision. And when that begins to deteriorate, you ultimately lose, you lose vision and again, can go blind if it, it's left untreated. There are two primary forms of macular degeneration. Uh, the dry type of macular degeneration is the most common kind and is um, the least treatable. And then there is wet macular degeneration, which affects the least number of patients. However, uh, there are some uh, treatments and remedies today by the 
retinal specialists of injections that can um, help slow this uh, progression and loss of vision down. Additionally, in age-related macular degeneration, um, there has been some studies done, and these studies were called ARIDS. I guess in the medical field we love in acronyms, and uh, ARIDS stands for Age-Related Eye Disease Study. And there were two of these studies that were done, the first ARID study and the ARIDS II study. And in that study, patients were given a combination of certain antioxidant vitamin and mineral supplements. Based on the second study, there are over-the-counter vitamin and mineral supplements that may attach the name of ARIDS II to it or Presser Vision. And these particular combination vitamin mineral antioxidant supplements have been shown to slow the progression down of people who have this condition. So these um, vitamin mineral antioxidants, are they beneficial for, for people who are aging that um, don't have macular degeneration? Is there any research on that? So I don't know that we have specific medical evidence to conclude that taking these pills will prevent you from getting it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that that's a study that could really be done, but they are over the counter. There's nothing in these supplements that are going to hurt the majority of people, True. especially in the newer ARIDS2 formulations where certain substances were removed from that, like beta carotene and vitamin C. Um, the newer pills uh, have been shown to be very effective and have a very minimal amount of, of side effects and complications. So one other thing I want to touch on with macular degeneration is once a um, patient is diagnosed with macular degeneration, mm -hmm. um, what's the next steps? So the next steps are to very, uh, is to monitor them extremely closely, uh, usually every, at least every six months. Utilizing that technology that we talked about before, the OCT or optical coherence tomography, which is a very painless, quick test can um, tell us about the state of that disease, tell us about the state of progression by doing an analysis, comparing it to previous scans. And um, ultimately, if we start to see these changes, we then would refer these patients to a retinal specialist for further evaluation and ultimately treatment if necessary. Very good. So, um, and these are the three that we generally see um, in the aging population, is that, that correct? That is correct. And if you would, I can go back and touch on um, cataracts a little bit more. Absolutely. There was something that uh, is interesting, that um, many, many years ago, um, probably in our grandparents' time, patients were hospitalized for cataract surgery and they had to wear glasses that looked like uh, fried eggs and uh, were very difficult to get used to. So today, as I was indicating, we use something called an IOL or an intraocular lens implant that um, is a very great technology that gives their patient almost their normal distance vision after surgery. Today, there are choices in implants that the surgeon will discuss with the patient, and that is what we call toric IOLs or special implants for patients who have astigmatism multifocal IOLs to eliminate um, glasses for both far and near, and a newer type of cataract surgery called femtosecond where a laser is introduced, making that procedure uh, more effective today as well. Very good. And another thing I do want to just touch on real quick is um, what is the newest technology and, and what is the newest technology that you're using? So the technology that we use today um, has varied since I first got out of school. I'm sure. <laughs> um, we have very sophisticated visual field instruments that help us map out any loss of vision in the periphery or central part of your, of your eyes. Uh, we have cameras that take pictures of the back of the eye and, you know, what do they say? A picture is worth a thousand words. And True. Rather than previously having to draw it out, we take these pictures and we can compare them year over year or six months over six months. Uh, we have that OCT, fabulous technology, that allows us insight into parts of the eye that previously we weren't able to see with the instruments that, that we have. We have um, autorefractors today that in children and adults and seniors 
that give us and tell us what it thinks the prescription is objectively without the patient saying which is better and which is worse. And all of these together is a great experience for the patient, giving them the latest in, in, in technology and the best exam that they can get. So do you foresee, because obviously technology is changing, you know, as mm -hmm. we speak, technology to change in the near future as well? I, I believe that there are still ongoing investigational studies of new instruments, new medicines, new therapies that are, will definitely help. To, um, to further, you know, help our patients, is sure, that correct? Sure, absolutely. And, um, you know, obviously, um, you, what, what are your goals and what are your, obviously, aspirations? Well, our, our, our goals are, and, and one of the nice things about optometry is, is that you could see your results almost immediately. So when you have a patient who maybe has uh, an elderly patient who has an early cataract, they may at that age have a big change in their prescription. But you can go in and you can examine that and you can change their glasses and they came in because they were unhappy and they couldn't see and even before referring them out sometimes we can change that prescription, get them to see better and the results are, are pretty much immediate and, and that's one of the beauties about optometry. Very good. And one thing I knew, I know I just asked you your goals and aspirations and, and that there's nothing wrong with that, but um, one thing I do want to touch on real quick and um, and I know this isn't obviously, I'm sure you know seniors want to know this as well, mm -hmm. um, but you know laser vision and, and PRK. It, can and I know you do, and obviously you can you can touch on this. You do the pre and the the post op. Sure. What if someone wants to come in and do that? Sure. So uh, for the last more than dozen years, I've been co-managing laser vision correction. I do the pre op and post op workups in the consultation, and it's not limited to a 30 year old patient. Uh, we have a patient of ours, and I believe she's um, north of 80 years old, and had it in her 70s and is doing wonderful and loves it. And even after laser vision correction, if they develop a cataract, the same procedures take place. They have cataract surgery. Um, laser vision correction can be done where um, it corrects the far vision and um, then you would need reading glasses. It can be done in a form called monovision. Mono means one, where you correct one eye for far and you correct the other eye for up close. So um, being a senior does not preclude you from having laser vision correction and a full examination and a consultation would let us know if you're a candidate for it or not. Good, and that's something I think is important because I think sometimes, you know, depending on whatever age we are, and maybe, you know, someone would think, how about actually, you know, touching on this as well, even if you're, you know, under 18, can you do that? So um, my guidelines, and they may differ from practitioner to practitioner, but my guidelines are generally, um, I prefer to wait until a patient is at least 21 years old for laser vision correction. And the reason for that is, is in your late teens and early 20s, um, your vision can change a little bit. So why do a procedure where the patient still potentially can have some change after that and may need a second or third procedure? So in, in my practice, um, we don't begin to talk about that until they're 21 or over. And then a lot of these patients, being there for 33 years, we've seen time over time, and we can see if their prescription is stable. In fact, we did your sister um, when she was 21, but her prescription was stable. It didn't change. And um, that assures us of, of positive outcomes and happy patients and great vision. Very true. And then also I, wanted, I want you to touch real quickly on um, seniors and everyone should they wear contacts to bed? So let me divide that into, into two parts, okay? We have many seniors that have been successful contact lens wearers for two or three decades or more, and they love their contacts and they don't want to give them up. That technology has changed over the years as well. That technology today, uh, we have lenses that you can throw out every day, every two weeks and every month. We have lenses that are more oxygen permeable and wettable than they ever were before. So one of the problems as we get a little bit older, and this is a great point to add to that, is dry eye. 
and as we, go, well, as we all get older, our eyes get a little bit drier, and we sometimes need um, tear supplementation, like artificial tears, over-the-counter tears, and lubricants and gels and ointments that can help with that a little bit. But some of the newer contact lenses today allow those seniors to continue to wear their contact lenses very successfully. My feeling on overnight wear, to directly answer your question, is that um, statistically, in general, Extended wear is not as safe as daily wear. It is better to remove that contact lens overnight, and that's the safe and effective approach to keeping patients from developing some more serious complications like infections, abrasions, and corneal ulcers. Um, these things really um, are not pleasant. They can prevent you from wearing contacts in the future. They can cause significant damage. And that just doesn't only go for seniors, that goes for the full spectrum of patients. There are lenses that are designed and approved by the FDA to sleep in, but there are reasons that certain patients may need to sleep with them. But for the vast majority, my philosophy has been daily wear as being more safe and effective. Very good. Well, Dr. Portnoy, it has been a pleasure having you on the show. And before I let you go, can you please tell us where someone can call in um, and make an appointment to have you on the show? Sure. So we have two locations. Uh, our primary location where I'm at most of the time is in the Pearl Vision in Wheeling at 727 West Dundee Road at 847-459-4477. And our second location in Lake Zurich at 664 South Rand Road in Lake Zurich. And our phone number there is 847-520-7737. Thank you again very much for all of this information. We appreciate everything. It's been great to be here. And thank you so much for having me. This has been a joy. Thank you. As Vita always says, when you get to the end of the rope, tie a knot because the best is yet to come. So keep on going because the best is yet to come. So tie the, at the end of the rope, tie the knot because the best is yet to come. Catch the spirits.